Good afternoon and welcome to Research in Action. We welcome you back after our summer break. Those of you who have been with us uh, previously know that this is a weekly event. Um, uh, every Thursday at 1 p.m. we have very different speakers for you. Uh, we do have a very full program for you throughout the fall and the winter. Please uh, you know, look at our website, Research in Action at FAU. Um, you find the whole lineup of our uh, presentations there. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Jeffrey Huber is an associate professor and also director of the Metro Lab and in the School of Architecture at FAU. Um, he teaches upper division architecture uh, studios and lecture courses on urban design and materials and methods of construction. His current research interests are around sea level rise in South Florida and he has uh, established over a quarter million dollars in grant funding through the National Endowment of Arts and the Florida Sea Grant programs. The, what you as our viewers may not know that research is not cheap and it requires quite a bit of an investment and it's not always easy to get that uh, funding for uh, these research projects. With that, I will turn it over to Jeff and have him tell you what he's actually doing in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And, and thank you, Gina, both for inviting me here today and then giving this presentation. Um, I just, uh, I want to share my screen here. Right. So I just wanted to thank, uh, thank you again for inviting me, Gina and Karen. Um, I'm really honored to, to be here and present this work. Uh, this has been an ongoing effort, and I don't know where the those numbers came from, but I think I, I think we're up to a half million. We've gotten two C grant um, grants through uh, Florida Atlantic University, and so I'm really excited by those opportunities. And actually, we'll talk a little bit about that today. But a little bit about myself: I'm an architect and a landscape architect. And as as Karen said, I'm uh, I'm an associate professor in the School of Architecture, and you know I, about. Um, Several years ago, uh, when I first got here, seven years ago now, um, we, I really wanted to engage in this issue around sea level rise and climate change, and that our region is really going to be at the at ground zero, uh, pretty much the canary in the coal mine when it comes to these these thinking. And I always like to start off with these talks and and, and giving a quote that's usually attributed to Henry Ford, but it goes like this. If I would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And I like that, that quote because it really talks about innovation and thinking about new ways of expanding how technology may occur in the future and that we may not necessarily see those things and how they play out today in, in our frameworks and our, in our frame of mind. So um, with that, you know, I, a little bit more about myself in 1992, I, I, I'm a Florida, one of the rare Florida natives. In 1992, I lived through a little uh, wind event named Hurricane Andrew. It's actually my house that's about center of this, uh, this photograph here, uh, which was a very impactful time in, in my career in moving towards architecture. I was actually 13 years old at the time, and this was a tremendous event, and we're just seeing uh, the recent hurricane, Hurricane Ida, especially what it just did uh, in New York City and the New Jersey region and, and what it did in New Orleans. And the, these events are going to become more and more prevalent as we, we move forward. And how do we begin to reconcile and thinking about ecosystem services within our urban environments to begin to, to work with nature um, and begin to create um, more mitigation as well as adaptation to these is going to be something critical to, to engage in and think about. And so um, I wanted to start out with this talk with just looking at data, like how do we know and where does, um, where does the sea level rise projections actually come from? How do we kind of understand this? Um, and working with the Center for Environmental Studies, they actually put together these graphics based on sources from NOAA. Um, but just to kind of show this, uh, we, our best data here in South Florida comes from Key West. It's where we've had over 100 years of historical tidal data um, to this point. And so this, this just tracks that showing if we actually put a linear curve or a linear uh, line across that, that we are actually rising in sea levels um, since the 19, early 1900s. And you can see currently we're about three to four inches higher than uh, where we were at at that averaging point um, towards the center of this. And when we start to think about um, 
the data that we have closer to us, you can see Virginia Key uh, has been added, this black line here. And that is, it was, came on around 1990s, early 1990s. And so this is data that we have closest to us here in Fort Lauderdale where I'm uh, stationed, but also uh, it's the closest to, to Boca Raton in, in this region. So we can really use these uh, to track and ask, actually overlap them. And what's the interesting thing you see here is when we take these linear lines and actually attribute them, you see something strange happening. Um, when we start to look at that expand over a time frame over the next, let's just say 80 years by 2100, um, how those lines look to be projecting based on the actual data and where we're seeing rise trends. It, it, it's interesting because you see Virginia Key would, would indicate, the black line indicates that it's actually accelerating, or at least it's more accelerated in Virginia Key than it would be in Key West. But that's, that's just based on the fact that we have this historical data and where it started. So we have the data that goes all the way back to the early 1900s in Key West and then the early 1990s in Virginia Key. And so these two uh, definitely don't correlate because we are seeing that more acceleration happening um, since the 90s in South Florida. And so this is what it's, it's indicating. And so when you look at uh, the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact's Unified Sea Level Rise Projection, and this is actually a 2015 number, they do have revised 2019, but I, I use this just because um, we, we track it and we kind of show these projection lines based on what NOAA's high, uh, what the Army Corps of Engineers and what the International Panel on Climate Change actually have. And so you see these different color lines, but how does that actually lay out when we add in this Key West historical data and Virginia data? And you start to see that the tracking is very similar. Um, so these curves are actually talking about acceleration of sea level rise over time. And what I want to uh, understand here is that we're seeing a slow rise right now, but it will begin to accelerate at an exponential rate as we move forward. Um, when we look at this, we, we, we send, tend to want to look out. And the, the reason for looking beyond where we are right now in 2021 out to 2100 is because most infrastructure is designed and planned to have a lifespan of 50 years. If you look at that, we usually take about 10 years just to design, plan, engineer, and actually fund those projects and get them built. So we really need to be thinking 60 years out when we're looking at infrastructure that we're building today. And that's interesting too, because it's also two mortgage cycles on a 30 year amortization rate in mortgages. And so these are, are critical things to understand is where we will be in the future. And so what I wanna show here is, is that in these 2015 numbers, it looked at about 28 inches on the low end of the projections, but it looked at it 72 inches on the high end. And so 72 inches is six feet of sea level rise that we could have by the end of the century. And so this became a critical number for us to look at. And if you look at the 2019 uh, compact projections, we're actually looking somewhere between seven and eight feet. So the numbers are not getting better as we understand more and more of the data and start to realize um, more and more information uh, that is being compiled now by scientists across the world. And what does this mean for South Florida? Well, as we, we see these projections, the blue graph is showing five feet sea level rise, six feet sea level rise. It's the, the black numbers are, are climbing up, but we're also gonna see a population shift where our population is gonna decline because of the fact of the carrying capacity and the, the likelihood of people being able to um, live out uh, and, and working with water or at least living with water and those challenges that are gonna be associated with it. And I, I like some of these previous studies that have been done. And I just, again, put these out here for uh, a little bit of background. But Zillow, um, back, a, a, back a couple of years ago, put out this, that nearly 2 million homes in the U.S. will be in jeopardy or will be susceptible or underwater um, if, six, if the oceans rose just by six feet. And so that number, six feet, becomes to be a, a critical bellwether when we look across uh, where we need to begin to think about and plan. Well, if you look at this graph, look at Florida, 1 million of those 2 million homes, half of them, 50% of them will, are in Florida. And so what does that mean for us? Uh, when you look at this other climate uh, central study that was put together, the 25 most vulnerable cities due to coastal flooding today per capita uh, based on their population densities, you see New York is number one, Miami is number two, um, and, and so on and so forth. But I want to point this out, is that all of these highlighted in pink are actually in Miami-Dade and Broward County. If we take just Florida and add a few more, 
only three of these cities are outside of our state. And so this really tells you that Florida, again, is that canary in the coal mine. It is the bellwether. It is the place where we're going to be engaging these issues around climate change and sea level rise adaptation at a much more prevalent rate over the next hundred years than any other community. And that's why it's so critical for us to begin to think about how do we design in this environment. And so you can almost say that Florida in a, a nutshell, especially South Florida is hot, crowded, flat, and, and flooded or flooding. And so how do we begin to reconcile those challenges? And I think one of the things that we need to do is start looking at the difference ways that we flood. Um, you know, Eskimos have a hundred words for snow. Uh, we generally think of flooding in one way, but we really have five types of flooding. And those five types of flooding come from storm surges off the coast, coastal storms. They also come from rainfall. I mean, we receive about 62 inches of rainfall a year. And the issue with that is that we're starting to see those 62 inches of rainfall falling in much, much faster rates, um, what we would call a, a storm, uh, a, a storm bomb or a rain bomb storm event, where we're seeing those floods or those rains coming at a much more extreme uh, time period. They're happening quicker, faster, but in less frequent storms. Like, um, you know, so storms are becoming more intense um, is, is what this comes down to. And so the, the other form of flooding that we have, a third, is urban runoff. You know, we have extreme massive amounts of impervious surfaces within our urban environments. And in some cases, uh, when we tracked it in Broward County, it's 80 to 85 percent imperviousness. That means that we're mostly paving surfaces with hard asphalt, concrete, rooftops. And so there's not a lot of places where water can go. That water then moves and sheds off the high ground, uh, basically flowing downhill and exacerbating flooding in low lying areas. We also have seasonal high groundwater tables that really create challenges, especially right now as we're in this wet season, there's not a lot of places where water can go uh, when, it, when it storms. And then our last is tidal flooding. We see a lot of flooding occurring now through king tide events, and that's where we start to see how this is going to affect us and compound to future uh, sea level rise. And, and why is it such a challenge in South Florida and why are so many of our communities in Broward and Miami-Dade County within that? Well, we basically live in a man-made um, you know, ecosystem that is controlling the, the way water moves through. That's where the South Florida uh, Watershed Management or Water Management District operates. We carved canals through here to make a lot of land uh, hospitable to development. Um, and so those challenges are really, um, really going to compound us as we move forward. And to see uh, the iconic coastline of Southeast Florida or South Florida in general here uh, from Lake Okeechobee South, you, you almost, um, we, we all recognize this and you can see West Palm Beach to the, the upper left-hand side or upper right-hand side, I'm sorry. Um, and then Key West all the way down uh, at the middle low uh, area. And our region here, if we see six feet of sea level rise, will begin to look like this. The blue is showing permanent inundation of water. And Fort Lauderdale, where, where Florida Atlantic University School of Architecture is located, is right in the center of, of many of the issues that are going to be confounded. And you may ask, well, why just north of here is West Palm Beach and, and Palm Beach County and those uh, fairly better off than where we see Miami-Dade and, and Broward counties? It's because of elevation. Um, it's the, because of the geology and the way that um, the the coastlines and the way that our geomorphology worked over the, the time period of, of history. And we see a lot where the Lake Okeechobee flowed directly to the south and to the southeast and would flow through these pine lands. Um, and so that's where you see the white islands where Miami is now. Um, those white pine lands, islands that uh, would be existing at that point, uh, really are the highest ground. And in some cases, 10 feet to 20 feet. Uh, some of the highest elevation we have between the two counties is, is 22 feet. And so, um, but on average, Miami-Dade County is only about four feet above sea level and Broward County is only above three feet above sea level. And so this really does compound these, these issues. And so if we just kind of zoom to, to Miami-Dade County and specifically more South Miami, uh, looking at Biscayne Bay, uh, here's what we, we have today. And what I'm trying to show is some of the pink lines showing salt, uh, where the current saltwater intrusion lines are. 
But just to, you know, there's nothing to need to really read here. Um, I'm just gonna flow through these graphics really quick here, but this is where we're at today. By 2070, here's what we are gonna start to have. So anything that starts to turn gray is gonna be permanently salt water. And one of the interesting things to see is that the Everglades essentially becomes a estuary. It essentially becomes a saltwater tidal marsh. By 2100, this is where we see that six feet, we will start to see those islands forming. And then by 2120, you can see that acceleration uh, where we have just a few dry areas um, left in the region. So this could be problematic and traumatic to some in looking at this. I see this as a, an interesting opportunity for how we begin to design and plan moving forward. Um, and I can tell you, it's not, it's not with things like this, where we see uh, in the city of Fort Lauderdale, where, where I am, uh, they post a lot of no-wake zone signs. And these are starting to be implemented during our king tide season right now. And, you know, this is a roadway that just has the, uh, the stormwater infrastructure working in reverse. So this is salt water in the roadway. Uh, here's another image of that. This is Las Olas Boulevard, the main boulevard that actually links downtown to the beach. Um, in the Las Olas Isles area, where it has about one foot of salt water. Again, not a single raindrop has fallen from the sky. This is just our, our infrastructure working in reverse. This is tidal waters moving up through the storm drains that are intended to flood uh, storm water. And so these are, are challenges we're seeing. There's a lot of, of different um, strategies that they are implementing now through tidal duck bills, uh, other things to stop that water from working in reverse. But ultimately that water, um, th those fixes are only about 10 to 15 years um, that they'll, they'll actually work until the system gets overridden. Um, here we see a, an example of storm surge. Even after Hurricane Irma, um, what was interesting is, is a lot of sand came up from the, the, the beach side onto A1A. And a lot of this is because we removed the dune habitats that were on there. And we always call them sand dunes, but I really think we should understand that sand dunes are not really sand dunes, they're root dunes. They're intended to have plants. And those roots actually uh, create an infrastructure to provide ecosystem services to prevent erosion and flooding and storms from really coming in and causing a lot of these, these issues. And then we all probably uh, remember several years back, and I mean, this could even have been yesterday, we had a pretty intense um, storm where seven inches of rainfall fell uh, within a few hour period of time and, and flooded huge amounts of areas and just overwhelmed our infrastructure. And so today I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about, you know, this, this project that we've been going through that we call salty urbanism. Um, and salty urbanism is its more pedestrian term. The actual um, name of the project is ADAPT, and it's an acronym that stands for Adaptation Design and Planning Tool. And it was really meant to be for coastal communities dealing and reconciling with uh, climate change and adaptation related issues. And so this is a, a, a huge effort between the FAU School of Architecture. We also have the School of Urban and Regional Planning at FAU, College of Engineering and Computer Science, as well as the Florida Center for Environmental Studies. Um, our partner organization was the city of Fort Lauderdale. And interestingly enough, the School of Architecture partnered with the University of Kansas, as well as the University of Southern California, who are dealing with similar issues, as well as um, local architects and landscape architect professionals. Um, I point out too that, and, and I know Karen also mentioned that we are funded by the Florida Sea Grant Program and NOAA. We're also funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. And I find this a unique opportunity because we are able to go ahead and, and, and showcase how we merge arts and sciences together and thinking through uh, these issues around urbanism and urban design, architecture, landscape architecture. And so over the last several years, we've done tons of workshops, have had uh, numerous presentations and exhibits of the work in the communities that we're working with, as well as within the, the region. And so salty urbanism, um, when we developed it, was is a methodology, a design framework that really has five toolboxes and utilizing scenario visioning that begins to look at how we, we couple that with within an ecotypic um, uh, response matrix. And, I, and I'll get into that here a little bit later. Um, but the first toolbox was these watershed urbanisms. And it was really looking at how do we begin to concentrate congealed developments uh, to begin to look at how we live and reconcile uh, and living with on and over water. And so those become the, the, 
the critical challenges. How do we begin to look at what gets removed? Where do we densify, intensify, um, and so on and so forth? And this is an important fact is that annual tax yield per acre of land use, this is a study that came out in 2010, uh, begins, and this is why it's so critical. I think everybody always talks about how do we pay for the infrastructure we need in order to make things work. Um, you hear a lot about the Green New Deal, some of these other things, but there's basic things that we can do as communities to ensure that we can actually pay for these services and pay for these infrastructures now. And one of that is, is looking at intensifying development um, and not necessarily large scale development, but look here where that blue bubble is. Um, this is mixed use low rise, typically something between two to four stories tall. Um, the types of, of tax base that you can reap from this in a year is around a 91 to $92,000. And so this is the, the threshold for which we can tend to pay for the basic services. Anything to the left of this, the food, fast food franchise, the big box store, uh, city residential, single family residential does not pay for the, it, it, it can't even pay for 80% of the basic services. That is to support uh, fixing potholes, fixing pipes, fixing uh, or paying for fire, sewer, and police services. Um, it's only at this point where you have the mixed use low rise that you can actually begin to pay for some basic services as well as begin to expand that and paying for these additional infrastructural uh, ideas that we, we need to, to have. And so it's really important to know the economics of how and what we build. Um, it's critically important to, to figuring uh, out how we're gonna begin to develop over time. And so what we began to look at with this was just how do we, we think about streets, open space networks, um, and other things within our built environment. And we came up with strategies for streetscapes. You know, how do we begin to in, in implement um, things that we would have for heat mitigation in the future? How do we plan for trees, street trees? And trees are amazing things because they're not only shade providers, but they are also bio pumps. They, they, a single tree can evapotrate, transpirate, that is uh, basically sweat out up to 100 gallons of water in a given 24-hour uh, period of time if it's the tree in the right place. And so trees can do fantastic things for us that pipes and other infrastructure can't. And they only degrade, uh, those pipes degrade over time where trees and other plant materials will actually enhance and get better over time. And so the second toolbox that we really want to look at was uh, kind of a forensic ecology, a, uh, a way of thinking about the historical understandings and underpinnings of the geology, hydrology, and ecology of where we are working. And so this is uh, our first project was in the barrier island, uh, which is a coastal uplands. And so this is just a diagram that begins to show how do barrier islands look? How does the the area next to the beach with the beach dunes and then the backside of the dunes and these hardwood maritime hammocks and then the mangrove uh, forests actually work and begin to understand those so we can begin to think about how those get integrated within the built environment. And this is a, a critical thing to think about because plants can do a lot of uh, free services for us where hardened infrastructure can't. Um, but if we look at the, the Southeast Florida and even the East um, United States East Coast, the hardened shoreline from loss of wetlands is, is tremendous. And if you look, there's uh, down in South Florida, we're not doing too well. I mean, we actually in, in Palm Beach, Miami-Dade and Broward counties are some of the worst hardened shorelines where we've removed a lot of the mangrove forest and natural uh, living shoreline from here. And if you look at Broward County in particular, we have about 85% of our shoreline edges are hardened. That is, they have seawalls or riprap, um, and they have no uh, ecological or plant-based infrastructure left on them. And so these create huge challenges. So this is why a third toolbox of ours was really implementing green infrastructure technologies. And so you can see uh, here on this top left, the living shoreline and going all the way through, we've actually began to develop a menu of all of these that start to look at how you flood and how you begin to organize those. So if you look at the top left, anywhere looking from a green roof all the way down to the bottom right, uh, floating breakwaters and other elements and everything in between, uh, whether they'll be bioswales, rain gardens, um, and the likes. And so this is a, a critical um, element that we're trying to build uh, akin to the periodic table of elements to really understand 
how infrastructure and how these green infrastructure as well as gray infrastructure elements can be working uh, together and in tandem. And so uh, then we kind of break in and, and get into those a little more um, detailed in understanding them and where they're appropriate and where they are needed. Um, and even further breaking those down. And so here you just see two examples of the bioswale and tree box filter um, that we're currently developing into a design manual um, for the regions here locally. That's one of the, the, the components of this grant is actually to produce a design manual that we're currently still uh, working through. And then a fourth uh, box was the uh, salt tolerant landscape palette. And so just looking at the types of plants, and I know it's a little hard to read here, but uh, from shade trees all the way down to ground covers, and then they're looking at their salt tolerance uh, from left to right, looking at less to high salt tolerance. And this is not talking about airborne salts. This is talking about their feet in salt water. And so their root systems and their ability to, to really survive. And these are the only plants that can really do that in the South Florida region that are also uh, local or indigenous plants. And so there's gonna be some critical um, um, needs to look at how landscape is not just ornament and decoration as we move forward, but how does landscape become infrastructure? And I think that's a critical next step. How do we think about landscape in the same way that we think about pipes, pumps, and other things and other elements? And so we, we've broken this up to really uh, become a menu for uh, most people to be able to use in the community. Um, and then the five or the fifth toolbox is actually an architectural building, flood adaptive uh, building typologies. And looking at the eight different types from abandonment all the way to floating structures and anywhere in between, even the, the way that we currently do things, which is essentially raising them on the mounds where you see that middle um, or raising them on stilts. Those are also common practices that we'll see around here in our community. Uh, the raised on stilts, typically on larger developments, you'll see tuck under parking and, and buildings, but uh, these are gonna become more and more apparent as we move forward. And so our design manual is actually building up a menu again of those to begin to more understand uh, how we begin to design these things. And we even give other elements of frontage design principles, but we're also looking at flood adaptive building and public interfaces. How do we make buildings that can adapt over that time period of, of the next uh, 80 years, um, knowing that those buildings will be in place, but how do we ensure that they still operate today? And so there's a lot of different ways and techniques um, that we're looking at, but ultimately there's only a few ways to, to adapt, and that's to elevate, inundate, or evacuate, or retreat. Uh, from areas. And so we, we fundamentally look at that. But another critical element that we have begun uh, developing is a, a table of materials where we're looking at appropriate materials that can manage and deal with flood uh, issues. And this is really important because especially when we're in a such highly corrosive environment, and we all know Surfside now, some of those issues uh, that have, have come and, and we can't speculate or, or really push, uh, put that climate change or sea level rise are related to those. But what we can ensure and understand is that the hotter we get, the more chemical reaction or the quicker chemical reactions happening are happening. So salts are activated at a more rapid rate. So if we get spalling or other elements that happen um, breaking into the concrete and getting to the rebar, we have tremendous issues where structures have the potential of failing. And so there's a lot of innovation now happening in materials. And that's one of the elements that we are carrying forward in our project is, is illustrating uh, fiberglass and other forms of reinforcement materials other than rebar uh, that can be achieved. And we're doing some tremendous research across the university and across the region um, to this, both at, um, at um, CTEC and other uh, institutes around. And so Fort Lauderdale as a case study was since the city of Fort Lauderdale came to us and, and said, we have a, an adaptation action area um, in North Beach Village. How do we begin to think about some of these practices in there? Um, and, and just to kind of show you, this is an image of the downtown Fort Lauderdale region. You can see the barrier island, the downtown um, and some of those effects. If we project six feet of sea level rise over the downtown region of Fort Lauderdale, um, you can see the tremendous impact of permanent flooding that's going to happen uh, here. And so this is why it's critical to begin to think about how do we develop infrastructure? How do we begin to develop the way we live and plan in these communities? And so the North Beach Village community you here hi see highlighted in pink uh, was the area that the city asked us to look at. Um, and it was a, a pretty interesting um, look. But if you look at the history, it was uh, the western part of the area was a tidal wetland. 
it was uh, filled in in the 1940s, late 1940s, pretty much built out by 1955. And by 2016, I uh, was really into the thick of it when we first started doing this project. And it's having even more tremendous building efforts in there today. And so what we began to think about is if the Fort Lauderdale is branded itself as the Venice of America, how do we begin to develop um, this area to begin to reconcile um, this? And so when you look just at North Beach Village, um, this is the projection of six feet over it. So you have permanent inundation of the western area of the neighborhood. Um, and so this is, is important because how do they begin to, to thrive and survive and, and adapt to this changing condition? And so we as, as students, as faculty, as, as other researchers began to lay out uh, a couple different scenarios for them. But the first thing that we did was looking at the first 10 years. What did they begin to do? And looking at streetscapes, enhanced streetscapes, what we call botanizing the asphalt of North Beach Village, since there was such a tremendous amount of impervious surface, one of the very key things to do was begin to break into that and plant plants. Um, then we began to look at three scenarios that you see articulated here onto the right-hand side, where the first one was a soft defense approach, second one strategic retreat, and then third land adjustment. How do we begin to look at um, those expansions? And so just to kind of walk you through a few of these, uh, the first idea was just those streetscapes. Again, the image uh, on the top left here shows the existing condition and where we were beginning to botanize that. And these plants began to provide rain gardens as well as shade. They extended uh, the street. They also began to slow tra traffic down and calm traffic. And I should say that most of our street design is governed by the FDOT or even what's uh, referred to as the, the Green Book uh, from AASHTO, which is the American Society of Highway and Transportation Officials. In that book, they call trees FHOs, fixed and hazardous objects. They call sidewalks auto recovery lanes. And so these are tremendous challenges for us when our own system for how we design streets is starting to set up trees as a villain in the sense that um, who are we designing the street for? And I think that's the critical thing that we need to begin to think about, especially in, in neighborhoods uh, where we, we see uh, trees as having a critical value for shade as well as, as stormwater uh, remediation efforts. And I just ask you to consider this. I mean, this is a, uh, the top image on the left is 150 feet from building edge to building edge. Most of you may know it as the Garden District of New Orleans. Um, it's an incredible um, street that was built over a hundred years ago. And look at the street trees, look at the trap, everything's working together. Uh, people are, are able to jog, there's multimodal uh, functions of, of um, street cars, working with cars, working with people walking. But look at the bottom image. This is basically a hundred feet from building edge to building edge. There's absolutely zero trees. It looks like an automobile storage yard. And I'll, I'll tell you on, on trash day, you know it's trash day because everybody's trash cans also out on it. And what I point to this is that our modern codes, the way that we, um, the standards that we put in place really diminish the, the ability for us to, to deliver both urban and ecosystem services. Again, ecosystem services being those related to flood or heat mitigation in this case, but also could be also linked to uh, refuge as well as food um, and, and those kind of basic um, uh, ecosystem services. So. The first scenario was the, the soft defense, which was really developing a green jacket around the community, uh, retracting a bit. One of the things that we found is that uh, we always call these wicked problems, the, the issues around sea level rise, but we found that there's even a more wicked thing, which is wicked permitting. Uh, the minute you try to push something beyond a seawall, especially if it's a navigable waterway, you get into permitting uh, criteria that in some cases could take up to 10 years to get a permit. And even then it's no guarantee that you'll get that permit uh, from the Army Corps of Engineer or from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection or one of these other agencies that having jurisdiction um, over those systems. So our best recourse in this neighborhood was actually to pull back one block, pull back and give up 300 feet and to do that, you'd have to use some sort of transfer development rights to, uh, because you're basically going through a takings at that point and how um, those, those landowners can actually get uh, development opportunity elsewhere and how um, to begin to look at that. But it was critical to get that 300 feet because in just 15 feet of marshy terrain along the edge, you can absorb up to 50% wave energy as well as up to 25% of the storm surge. And keep in mind that fact that a, a one tree in the right place 
um, and the right type of tree could evapotranspirate again up to 100 gallons of water in an, a 24 hour period of time. So it really becomes critical when you start to add multiple trees, thousands and thousands of trees. Um, I always say in the communities ask, what's the simplest thing we can do? It's plant trees. I mean, that is um, the simplest thing and the, and the most effective thing you can begin to do, but you really need to think about planting them in the right places as well. And this is just what some of those areas could look like along that shoreline. Once you retract, you could still have architecture. You could still do pretty inventive uh, things. You could still implement housing and other elements. You just uh, would do it in a different way. And so the second scenario looked at retreat and this strategic retreat away from the western edge of the community. And so we moved half of that neighborhood and intensified it up on the uplands where it was less likely to flood and then gave that back through transfer development rights to nature. Um, but it's not to say, again, that you could not build in it. It's just along that western edge, you may do more amphibious or floating architecture or other elements um, like the, uh, the section here on the top indicates and even the, the image to the bottom uh, where you could have uh, floating walkways and other things through a park, an eco park. Uh, that begins to become not only part of your infrastructure for, um, for protecting mainland as well as the barrier island, but also uh, becomes a, a, a valuable recreation corridor and amenity um, for, for other things like wading birds. And um, that was one of the tremendous things we found through this, this study and working with some of the local scientists and, and planners was um, that even wading birds, word, birds that we know as iconic, the, the heron, the egret, are all gonna lose habitat in the future uh, because they're gonna lose those tidal wetlands because those tidal wetlands will not have the capacity uh, to keep up with the accelerating sea level rise. So one of our, our actions here was actually to create these floating biomats that you see here, these kind of ring islands uh, that would create those, those habitats. Uh, they would just be tethered um, to other elements or anchored in a way to, to keep them in place. And then along the, the edges, I mean, we had to look at integrated ecological um, management. I mean, we all know the state bird, the mosquito, and, and those are the huge challenges that we, we have here is how do we think about management of these pests? And one of the reasons why the mangrove islands or the mangrove forest were removed was, was it was a tremendous issue, but there's a lot of, of great literature and understanding now, how do we control larvae? How do we control uh, mosquito populations? So we were actually integrating those with purple martin houses, bat houses, but also looking at dragonfly habitats because dragonflies have the tremendous ability of eating tons of larvae um, as well as um, other uh, ecological systems or ecological um, tools that we could actually deploy um, that basically give us free work. But we're also, again, looking at uh, implementing the beach dunes, these root dunes that would come back in um, and actually create sand engines for us along the, the beach line itself. So the edges became very important in, in both of those previous strategies, as well as this third one, the land adjustment, where uh, we looked at um, increasing uh, the, the surface edge, shoreline edge, and that had the, the double uh, benefit of shoreline edge has value. It has real estate value but it also has the ability to clean the water, to deal with ecosystem services, as well as these urban services that we want um, to maintain. And so this last one really looked at how do we begin to be more inventive about a land adjustment, which is a, a legal right that communities can come together and rethink how they build um, uh, their areas. And so it's a, a reshifting of the way that the platting currently works, uh, removing that and allowing for it to be readapted or uh, readjusted into a better uh, system for ourselves. And so this was really us taking that, that third stance of, of saying, well, let's take um, Fort Lauderdale for its word and calling itself the Venice of America. Let's create these kind of waterways um, through the neighborhood. And so this would uh, provide us the ability to, to kind of build um, these, these larger scale communities, but also to build uh, the next generation of, of economic um, prosperity building and, and beginning to, to bring back farming, especially oyster nursery farming for mangroves and other things that would be essential in, in providing those for new infrastructure. Um, and so those opportunities existed. And so um, what we began to think about is now applying that regionally and how do we begin to look at it? Uh, we must begin to look at it from an ecotypic perspective. 
And there's four main ecotypes that exist. If you recall the white islands that were in that one uh, image, they are the islands, the pinelands uh, that would be left. And so those pinelands are actually showcased here, if you can see my screen, in this brown color. Then there's the glades and uh, transverse glades that are, are kind of indicated in these green colors. And then there's the coastal uplands, which is more so in, um, in, in another color that's uh, a little hard to see here, but it's really um, relegated to that, that barrier island ecosystem. And what's interesting is if you look, if you drew a transect and just pretended that we did not build anything on it, so from a natural perspective, uh, this top section would really indicate um, how our ecosystems work in Southeast Florida. And so if you look here, this is the ocean, we have a barrier island, we have an intracoastal waterway, uh, we have tends to be low-lying coastal marsh and mangrove forests, and then you get into these coastal ridge and transverse glades, and then you get into this kind of Everglades ecosystem. Well, by 2100, this is how it's going to change to the bottom image. These are the future ecologies. We're going to actually look more like the Florida Keys. There's going to be more smaller little islands that are out there as outcrops that are going to get inundated here and there. And the one area that we have left that's high and dry is these hardwood coastal ridge hammocks um, that would, would occur. This is the one spot where we still have access to fresh water. We'll actually be losing, and there's going to be a tremendous amount of saltwater intrusion into the aquifer at that at that moment. So these will create um, serious challenges for us and how we live. The other interesting thing is that when we have this, we're also going to transition where certain animals are going to begin to disappear and other animals are going to expand. So, you know, the, the iconic alligator will begin to be less frequent um, and give rise to more of crocodiles and other types of creatures that are more su suited and situated uh, for saltier environments. And so this is going to be a tremendous um, um, uh, change and transition for us. And so this ecotypic response matrix that we're beginning to develop now uh, looks at those four main criteria. If you look at uh, the, the kind of four columns here, uh, that first one to the left, Everglades, the second one, Transverse Glades, and then Coastal Ridge and Rocklands, and then Coastal Uplands. Each one of these come up with a way to look at the historic ecology that was once there, and how that works to the present, that's that second row, there's the present. This is kind of where we see it today. There's canals, um, large scale uh, lakes, uh, what we call these kind of surf and turf landscapes in the Everglades or anything west of I-95. You, you generally get that type of development because these were the areas that were carved out of the Everglades. Um, so you get those, those Rockland and, um, and the, the lakes and, and canals and so on and so other features. Um, but we're also on the third uh, from the bottom row, it's, it transitions. So we're going to need to think about how do we develop infrastructure and transition. And so that last one, the coastal uplands is what I, I showed you or the last uh, column is really what that Fort Lauderdale uh, North Beach Village project um, is kind of like. And so these, these other three are the ones, the Everglades, Transverse Glades, Coastal Rock, uh, Coastal Ridge and Rocklands is the ones that we're currently developing um, further. And to kind of expand on them, uh, here you can see them a little bigger, but the current condition is the top. And then how we're thinking about those future conditions, that bottom row, how they would transition over time. And so interestingly enough, it starts to give you an attitude for how we're going to retreat, how we're going to elevate, and how we would, would basically allow for inundation to happen in some of these communities or a hybrid thereof. And so you can see uh, on the left-hand side in the Everglades and in the coastal uplands, those are the ones that are going to need to give up more land in order to uh, provide ecosystem services from large amounts of green infrastructure. That is, think about parks more than pipes in those cases. Um, and then you can see those middle two uh, really allow for shoreline edge and really thinking about how those uh, begin to integrate and work well. And just to kind of jump in a little bit, here's the current condition of one of these surf and turf suburban developments. Uh, think again, uh, west of I-95 um, here in Southeast Florida, uh, these communities like Weston, uh, Coral Springs and, and others, how those would need to uh, begin to retrofit over time. So we have a transition where we would need to have urban decommissioning. And this is an important lesson that we're beginning to find because um, just like communities um, and cities have departments of planning, they should also have departments of unplanning uh, where we can begin to control the urban decommissioning. But that unplanning department is, is ironic because we're removing the built fabric or we're letting it go, but we're transitioning it to allow for it to become part of the infrastructure to begin to protect us in the future away from uh, some of this flooding, as well as ensuring that 
our urban development, as they do begin to flood over time, do not become del deleterious in the sense of the effects that it will have from carcinogens, toxins, and other things that will get uh, placed into the environment. And so um, we're really trying to look at those kind of ability of infrastructure and transition, uh, why it's moving from a freshwater system to a saltwater system uh, that's going to have tremendous effects. And then ultimately moving to a new transformed condition where there could be new economies around ecotourism, agriculture. Um, this area in this region is still the only subtropical region in the continental United States, which has a lot of abilities for us to, um, to, to utilize that climate and that context in certain strategic ways. And so this is uh, an image of what that inundation or what that, that transitionary period where it's, it's mostly hostile, uh, where we're gonna have a lot of decommissioning and abandonment, but ultimately moving to something that is more stabilized and just saltier in the future. And how do we begin to think about that? So our, our Western communities will really feel more like outposts and, and very concentrated um, you know, um, uh, developments that are on dry, possibly uh, human constructed dry uh, platforms and mechanisms. Um, and then we're looking at the, the coastal ridge in Rockland here as that current transition and transformation uh, that those three images are playing out. And looking down in Miami um, along Biscayne Bay, I mean, one of the things that you're going to begin to see is a lot of die off along or along Biscayne Boulevard, a lot of die off and decay. I mean, um, and how do buildings begin to become um, that are going to be abandoned, become uh, reinvigorated or reinvigorated to become something uh, anew. And so we have to look at how does the environment get clean, cleansed. And so that's what some of these elements that you see in the middle uh, of the image are looking at is these biomops, which are basically mo uh, mangrove and oysters. Uh, that begin to do tremendous things to clean water, but biomats um, and some of these other kind of digesters for, um, for um, different uh, materials like algae blooms and others, as well as aerating the water to maintain that, as well as kind of dealing with acids and everything that are going to be in the waterways, ultimately arriving to a condition where we can thrive once again in these landscapes. It's just we've adapted to them. And so this is... Um, uh, where we're, we're at in the project, but ultimately the project is, is, is developing a design manual that's consolidating a lot of these efforts that have been visioned and visualized by uh, the faculty, staff, and, and researchers over the last five years here at Florida Atlantic University. And I just want to end on this thought because only urbanism is going to give our architectural professions uh, the holistic framework through which complex systems can be engaged. Uh, the irony is, is that urban design and urbanism are usually the missing discussions and the pieces on resilience and adaptation planning. And so these are, are going to be our challenges is how do we begin to think about how does all of this come together and coalesce? And that's ultimately what the Salty Urbanism Project uh, begins to do. So its novelty is not necessarily um, bringing new things to light. It's about how do we bring all these disparate pieces together in one cohesive framework and thinking about how does um, urban and ecosystem services begin to thrive as we look at a future for living on, with, and over water in Southeast Florida. And with that, I, I thank you and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. Very interesting and uh, I think a little bit disturbing, <laughs> even though you're pointing out, you know, ways to mitigate uh, the potential threat. Um, so we do have, a, have time for a few questions. Just as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question. We will go through as many questions as possible and then uh, we will ask our presenter to answer our additional questions offline and we will post them on our website. Now, Jeff, you mentioned um, that landscaping, use, the use of landscaping um, quite a bit in your talk. The, one of the questions here is, uh, do you have a recommendation on what are the best trees for absorbing water in Florida? No, and that's a great question. I, one of the challenges that we've had over the last five years is finding information on subtropical and tropical plant species with some of those. But uh, we're looking now more at what's called freophytic trees. It's those trees that love bottom. Uh, they're the kind of the, the lowland dwellers. Um, and so if, if we're looking at um, you know certain types, um, it would be those. So buttonwoods, uh, we've started looking at gumbo limbo, some of these other ones that really uh, can thrive in certain conditions. The issue that we're having and the challenge that we're having is is that we're going to be moving to a saltier environment. So 
um, certain trees that thrive in freshwater. Um, we'll just have to, that's why I was, I was trying to point out, it's critical to know where you are in the best place for the right plant. And there's a lot of research that's beginning to be done on that. Um, but we, we are looking at when you, when you see mangrove forests, they can do a lot of benefits beyond just the evapotranspiration benefit. Um, you know, and so the, the, the mangrove buttonwoods are our best bets for uh, saltwater shoreline areas. And when you look at freshwater, it's going to be getting into some of the, um, the, the mahoganies, the, the gumbo limbo, and on, other ones that are more local and indigenous tree types. Great, thank you. Um, so planting more trees also has a downside given that we are in hurricane country here, right? Um, so how do you balance, uh, you know, planting more trees uh, versus, you know, having the, the hazards with uh, potential hurricanes coming? Yeah, no, that, and that's a, it's a great question. It's a question I always get because um, one of the things is you should be planting local trees because those trees have adapted to hurricanes in this region. Um, but two, you have to look at the planting strategy. Uh, no longer can we plant in monocultures. Some of the times we see issues is when we plant one plant and think that's going to hold up. When you think about these, most of the, the hardwood hammocks that you would see in the Everglades or other areas were always a collection of multiple types. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's complex or it's more complex than mono, um, you know, these monocultures. So you have to look at companion planting. You have to look at, you know, planting more than just that one type of tree. Um, and so we're looking at those even along streetscapes as being more drifts where you may have a few of the same tree and then a few of the other tree because also trees are susceptible to disease. And we have to understand that. And they may be susceptible over time um, to changing water conditions from fresh to salt. Um, and so you, you really need to think about those things as you're, you're beginning to plan. And that's a lot of the information that we're still kind of baking out in this research and, and getting into our design and, and construction manual for, uh, for the Salty Urbanism Project. Is there any place where um, the public, uh, we as the uh, normal people can go to get more information on what we personally should and could be doing to improve our landscaping, to be more um, prepared? Uh, there's plenty of places, and I think our region is, is doing some wonderful things. I know Broward County is really uh, trying to get some great things, especially from a living shoreline perspective, what you can do if you do have uh, low wave or no wave or high wave energy uh, shorelines. Um, but there's also a lot of information on bioswales, low impact development, low impact development just being uh, ecological stormwater infrastructure, basically thinking about that plant rather than a pipe again. Um, there's a tremendous, I just saw that even Deerfield Beach has a pretty amazing landscape palette um, on, on theirs. So these cities, as well as the counties, do have a tremendous amount of information. Um, it's, it's consolidating that information into one area for, um, for homeowners and for property owners to really have that is becoming more and more the challenge. And I think that's why um, Broward County or even the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact are really trying to come to the table to be that one-stop shop or that, that source of information. Um, and quite frankly, that's what we're hoping this design manual could also serve as, as we're developing it and getting it. Um, yeah, um, I think that, that would be very important, right, to have that one-stop shop where people can go and, and get more information. Um, you showed that graph, and I'm, I'm uh, pivoting here. Um, you showed the graph where it looked like before 1990, there was really not a huge increase, at least in sea level rise. And is that because the measurements were just not there or was it truly no, no change? And then the other question here is, um, is there a top level basically? Does it actually going to stop at some point or will the sea, are the ACs actually expected to rise uh, continuously from here on? Yeah, no, and, and those are all great questions. And to answer the first one, uh, it did, it, it, we were having some sea level rise, but you have to understand the industrial revolution started in the 1800s where the biggest impact that's contributing to the acceleration of sea level rise is the CO2 in our air. Um, and so that's really based on the, the, the issues. And, and we've been tracking the parts per million over the last uh, several decades. And you're seeing that uh, increase even more. And so the parts per million, the last time we were at this was with, with the last basic uh, melt that we had um, from a, if you're looking at that glacial to, um, to melt periods over time, uh, we've actually put out so much CO2 that we're, we're where we are at 
at this point, and um, again, I'm not a scientist to this, but I, I, I know through a lot of the scientists we've communicated, um, we've bought into a certain amount of sea level rise. How much sea level rise is not is the question, but I can tell you right now, and I always love John Englander's book. Uh, he's an actual author there in, in, in Boca Raton, um, but you know, high tide on Main Street was the first one to kind of put this, that we, we live in a 612 foot elevator, elevator. And if you think about it, we're at 400 foot sea level right now. So that means we have 212 feet of potential sea level rise that could happen in the carrying capacity and the mechanisms of how the, um, the hydrology of the wor earth works. And so 212 feet is a lot of feet. I'm not saying that that's what we're going to see, um, but that's where um, the potential in the last melt that we had where there was no ice um, on earth, it would be 212 foot higher than what it is today. That is quite high. <laughs> yeah, the question, the question is, is just how fast that would occur. And yeah. in nowhere in history, and this is why we can pretty much are assured that it's a human cause because nowhere in history has it happened this rapidly where we saw CO2 rise and the exponential or the acceleration of sea level rise. That has never happened in the history of the, the, the earth that we know. That, that is why this is becoming such a challenge for, for us to begin to work with in our communities today. Now you talked about like the alligators, uh, the, the number of alligators going down and the crocodiles increasing and such, which, uh, uh, which su suggests that um, we're also going to have a uh, an infringement on the supply of fresh water. Uh, is that correct? Well, definitely. Our biggest challenge and where we're going to probably see a huge population loss is, um, you know, is, is going to be when we lose the Biscayne Aquifer as a drinking water supply. And that's ultimately, you know, again, I don't want to be the, the quote unquote Debbie Downer here, but, you know, that, that ultimately will happen at some point. Um, the question is, is when, and, you know, that's, not for me to really speculate on. I mean, me as a designer, um, I, I know we can figure out ways. Maybe we wouldn't be able to, to have the carrying capacity that we have today and the population density that we have today um, because we would have to move back to um, living with the amount of rainfall that falls in our landscape. So collecting water from roofs, collecting water in our landscape will become critical to provide that drinking water supply for us. And so uh, this is how a lot of communities, even when you look at uh, Palm Beach County, you know, works, they, they work from a surface water driven. That's why you have a lot of those reservoirs to the, to the west of downtown. Uh, but you have communities like in uh, where, where I was previous to this um, uh, in, in Arkansas, they're all driven by surface water because the, the aquifers are too far down to access. And if you look at California, they diverted the Colorado River to get access to water. So there's, there's ways in which to do it, but unfortunately, you know, they're not always the most sustainable ways. And so the most sustainable way was, is to, to harvest and farm the, the water, the resources that you have um, that come from, um, from the ground or from the surface area rather than below surface. Yeah, so we're, we're just about out of time, but I'm going to finish us off with one more question before I do that uh, to our attendees. Remember that this uh, will continue, this series will continue on a weekly basis again. So look out for our next presentation next week. Uh, and Jeff, here's the, our last uh, question. What can uh, a modest single family homeowner do to support um, the efforts, the, your, your efforts basically, to help improve infrastructure in our communities? Should we lobby to city representatives? What other changes can we do? You mentioned the landscape, but is there anything else that we can do? Yeah, I think the, the first thing that we need to do is, uh, you know, basically make it um, remove turf grass, you know, keep it minimal. If you need turf grass for dogs or your kids, I mean, have that, but turf grass really does not provide any ecosystem services for us. So look at native plantings, um, begin to in, in, integrate those into your community. And, and, you know, quite frankly, homeowners, you know, harvest rainwater, uh, put in photovoltaics, you know, make sure that we have, uh, that we get off or that we're not contributing to the CO2 in the atmosphere, but we're also contributing to how we should be living in this community. I mean, we are an environment that was always saturated with water. I mean, start to understand that at times streets, it's just like a snow day for Northeast, you know, or when it's, when it's uh, tidal flooding, don't, you know, it's like, we, we're going to need to go to this telecommuting uh, maybe and, and allow for things to flood 
um, in, a, in a structured and methodical way. But um, homeowners, uh, we, we all can do our, our part from that standpoint, you know, reduce uh, CO2 and, and try to implement some of these. Uh, the, the minimum thing you can do, again, is plant, plant trees. <laughs> Great. With that, I know we have a number of more questions. Jeff, we will ask you to answer those offline sure. and we'll post the answers on our website. But with that, thank you very much. I appreciate you kicking us off here in our fall uh, series of presentations and very interesting topic. Thanks again. Thanks thank uh, for calling in. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.